Harwood. Um, so I've done a little bit of digging around and I've discovered. Ricky Grove. Fog comes in on little cat feet. <laughs> Phil Rice, this is the best film that I've seen all year and maybe ever. Damien Valentine, use the machinima, Luke. Hello and welcome to And Now for Something Completely Machinima. The podcast about machinima, virtual production, and related technologies. I'm here with my co-hosts, Tracy Harwood, Damian Valentine, and Ricky Grove, and I am Phil Hello. Rice. Hello. 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 So this week is Ricky's pick, and bonjour, Ricky. It is a very nice collection of uh, happy French poetry called... Uh, yeah, the Baudelaire's... The Fleur de Mal, I believe is how you pronounce it. The Flowers yep. of Evil. Uh, but like Baudelaire, this is uh, beautiful. So, Ricky, why don't you tell us about it? Sure. This is an interesting type of film that can only be found, for the most part, in a virtual world like Second Life. Second Life frequently is have has live performances. It could be dance, it could be music. In this case, it's what's called a particle show, which I'm not entirely sure how that exactly works inside of Second Life. But Tootsie went, uh, by the way, Tootsie Navrati is a, one of the true artists of machinima. We've been following his work for, good Lord, 15 years now. And all of his stuff is completely original. And he, he's one of those directors that combines live action with animation and machinima. He's a, he's a avant-garde, I guess is what you could call him. In this case, he decided to record and re-edit a live performance of a particle show, a particle show being, I guess, particles in a 3d environment where you know particles would be like a star stream or a fire stream or graphics would change and move around camera his own camera and then created a short film out of it uh feeling that the title should be based on the Baudelaire poems. And what's fascinating about the Baudelaire is Baudelaire was one of the first poets to actually uh, herald modernism in poetry, in which he combined this sort of technique and style with very, very gritty details. So it was a unique combination. That's why he calls it flowers of evil. So the combination of the two things seem to be incongruent but the way he puts them together they're completely original and that's what this movie is is completely and utterly original the music that's chosen to accompany them is a french band i'm sure tracy will give us all the details on that it's a short film it is a collection of visual elements um, that are layered so that they flow into each other and expand and contract in different visual shapes, different visual colors. The music helps lens an atmos changing atmosphere, sometimes of ominousness, sometimes of sort of brightness and sweetness to it. So the contrasts are all there like in Baudelaire. And I found myself just utterly entranced by this short film. It's not particularly original in a sense that this kind of thing has been done before. Early modernist filmmakers in animation uh, created many things like this. Combinations, just, just abstract shapes. I think we saw this not too long ago in a film that I picked. Um, there was an old one that had abstract shapes that were made from a game. But this one is in particularly great because I think if you were not a fan of abstract poetry or abstract visualizations, you would like it anyway, because it's just so pleasant. And the length is absolutely right for it. Just about the point where you don't want to see anymore, that's when it stops. So I just love this film. I think it's great. I think Tootsie is a remarkable 
uh, uh, creator. I think the people that did the live performance should be praised for it. What did you guys think of it? Oh, amazing. Absolutely amazing. Shall I give you my take on it and then you, you guys can pick up the other bit? Sure. sure. Yeah. Sounds great. All yeah. right. Okay. So like you say, Tootsie's recording of this, uh, this it's actually an installation um, that uh, was supported by the Second Life Endowment for the Arts. Okay. Um, uh, so they, 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 you know, they gave some Linden dollars to uh, create the show. Um, and as you said, it's a scripted particle show. And the original creators were Lali Sorbet and Chris. Um, and it, in this particular um, rendition of it, this this short of it, what you've got is um, uh, an accompaniment accompaniment of an of a track, which is actually called Le Fleur du Mal, um, by Sahale. Um, a guy called Sahale, I think his name is. Um, and it's from his album called Buddha Bar, Buddha Bar 21, I believe. Um, there's actually a full recording of the of the whole show on Chris's channel, which we'll put a link to in the in the show notes as well. Uh, and it was um it was at a, a, a launch event or a main showing of the of the installation itself, um, which I'm guessing is where Tootsie has done his recording as well. Um, on the 20th of January, the whole thing took place, this exhibition of it. Um, and actually, the whole show was an hour long. And there's a really uh, interesting playlist of music to it as well, of which this is one of the pieces of music that was selected for it. So it's not the only thing that it's it's uh, accompanies it. Now, I understand the installation has, in fact, been on a loop. Um, so you could actually also go and visit it. I'm not sure how long um, it's going to be available for, um, but there is a map link, which I can also put on the show notes. I have to say, I did go and try and find it, um, but at the time it wasn't actually running. So I didn't manage to sort of um, get a sense of what it was doing. As I understand it, this is an installation. It's centred on a 3D set of um, standing stones, like um, like a, a circle of standing stones, and this kind of lava-like fountain object, um, which spews out things a little bit like a kaleidoscope. And all the images that you see, these particles, are really what I would call like an old... You, you remember those old-fashioned children's toys, those kaleidoscope things? It's very like that. Um, to create it, I understand Lali and Chris have built this particle system, which they called Bloom. Uh, the installation shows some really intriguing elements, which to me looked a little bit like protozoa or pre or early life forms, which are then attempting to kind of converge. And then later in the in the show, there appears to be more complex life forms and eventually these kind of humanistic representations, which you do also see in Tootsie's show. Uh, Tootsie's recording of it. Um, and then these colours that also seem to represent this sort of increasing level of complexity go from sort of single colours to multiple and then kind of almost like kaleidoscopic rainbow type colours as well. So, so there's a number of ways the complexity is communicated through what this installation is doing. What you see in Tootsie's video are also the avatars of some of those who seem to have been at the show. And I think... Um, also became part of the installation during the show. Um, now, as you said, um, Ricky, the work's um, inspired by the, the French poet Charles Baudelaire. Um, they used an in in English translation of his most um, famous volume of work, the Fleur du Mal. Um, I don't know if you know this, but when it was originally published in 1857, it was considered a scandalous work. Um, for its portrayals of decadence, sex, same-sex love, death, and kitchen sink. Yeah, the corruption. Por yeah, it was sewers, it was like pornography, it was por pornographic. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, and the the corrupting and oppressive power of also the modern city and lost innocence. Um, so it was basically considered by these um, artists uh, to still be relevant uh, in its commentary um, about modern life today, which is kind of why they selected it. In fact, that book of poems led to Baudelaire and his publisher being prosecuted for creating an offence against public morals. It was banned. As well, in they should. Indeed. Well, <laughs> it's banned in France, can you believe this, for a hundred years. And it was only 
published in France in the late 1940s, although that the offending poems were actually Disgusting. published in, Hel in Belgium in the mid-1860s in a book called Les Epaves, or The Scraps. Now, I found a copy of the translated version of the book on Project Gutenberg's website, and I also found a website dedicated to Baudelaire's complete Fleur de Mal works, which I'll share too in case you want to have a look at uh, what was in those. And there's translations, various different translations of them on those sites as well. I think this film is is really quite a compelling snapshot of the of the installation. Um, in the full film of the installation, you do get some of the sense of the themes in those poems, although the imagery and its various kind of colourful rhythms, um, you know, there those are those things are, are things that come through very strongly. I think. I think what you get in this documentary, though, Putsi's work is the sense of the mystique and the intensity of of it, which perhaps doesn't come through so well in the full installation recording of it. Um, well put. And, well put. Yeah, uh, well, indeed. But also that's um, because of his choice of music to it as well. I mean, this is a, a really interesting, um, uh, you know, a piece by Sir Harley, um, I think it's a, it's a, you know, it's also called um, Fleur de Mal. It's a, it's, it's a brilliant pairing because the video and music are so complementary. I think in their attempts to evoke the sense of what was in these yeah. poems, uh, and you, I think what you pick up is the kind of the sh almost sh sh is the word shamantic, shaman and shamantic, spiritual. Anyway, that's what I mean, spiritual. Where shamanistic, shamanistic, that kind of thing, where it draws on these kind of tribal themes from. And I and I picked up both African and South American themes, as well as kind of electronic mm. instruments, all of which seem mm. to convey this kind of life force. I think the music is it's all about the music, really. Um, I didn't actually there. There's some spoken words in the music. Um, I didn't find out what they were because um, obviously they're you know they're also spoken in French. But my guess would be they're actually from one of Baudelaire's poems. Um, I don't know which one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my impression. Yeah. Um, now, I think Tootsie's work... It is doesn't actually... make any difference because it wasn't about the words. Exactly. It was about the visual. Exactly, exactly. But but to um, Tootsie's film of it, I think, is something slightly different because I interpreted this as quite a poetic piece in itself. It gives you a sense of being some kind of voyeur of this experience. And the fact that he's captured the audience... It, it, who were who were at this sort of exhibition of it, I think is quite an interesting voyeuristic act as well. Um, and it's interesting because it helps you appreciate that the installation is basically attempting to connect with the audience as a kind of, you know, as they are, they're basically virtualized avatars, um, you know, as, as, uh, well, they're virtualized avatars, but what's happening is this particle system is kind of continually passing over them and through them. And I think what you're, you're witnessing, actually, is what I can only really describe as a sort of cosmic orgy, <laughs> which I'm sure you'll love to comment on. But that's that's what I think this this is. Let's, sort of let's be careful here now. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so I think in that sense, too, there's this kind of subtle reference. Come on, Tracy. To the core themes that run through the Second Life community as well. And when I was looking at Chris's work, uh, and Lali and Chris's work, Chris has actually yeah. got yeah, yeah, yeah. far more explicit work um, in, in that regard on his channel. So, uh, you know, there's there's a subtext to this as well, I think. Overall, to me, it's, it, it's actually probably one of the most incredible particle installations I've seen ever created, I think. Um, but it occurred to me that probably the best way to watch this isn't just on a 2D screen. What you really need is a VR headset on in Second Life, um, actually experiencing that installation firsthand. Nice foot. Um, uh, and I would imagine that having done that, what you'll have is a, a is a kind of you know you'll you'll really be able to experience the kind of the magic quality that they were trying to aim for. That kind of 
hallucinogenic um, kaleidoscope of stuff going on around you, um, which I think is really quite a, a, a fascinating thing to have created in the way that they they have. Um, so I, you know, all in all, I thought it was a it was a really great pick. Um, not the same as the installation itself, evoking what the installation was was about, but actually doing something else as well. Um, so yeah, nice pick. Thank you. Good point. Yep. Yeah, you know, capturing the experience of of something that's to be attended like this is tough. You know, just like I mean, I I went to see uh, I got got the opportunity to see Pink Floyd in concert in the mid '90s um, in in this huge arena in Nashville, and they had, of course, they're renowned for during that tour a lot of light shows and and extraordinary visuals. And I've seen I've seen well made videos of concerts from that era, and yeah, it's it's not the same as being there. I mean that that kind of goes out without being said. So, but I think this film is beautiful, um, and it is. It's entrancing. That was a great word that you picked for it, Ricky. Uh, it, it it was mesmerizing, um, and that's coming from a guy who will be the first to admit that that you know abstract art and how to experience it i feel like a little kid like i have no idea what i'm doing but i, I for it didn't bother me it, like i was conscious of that because i can't help it i'm 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 a little insecure about that i think but i just enjoyed this i enjoyed watching it uh and and imagining myself there it's funny you mentioned the vr headset element tracy because that's exactly what i thought as i was watching it is Okay, this is something that a VR, VR that a VR headset that's a use case I would be really intrigued by mm. to experience something like this. Um so uh yeah, just just wonderful. And and it's it's hard for me to like imagine as as set out to make a video of this. You know, one one of the key things with creating a video with any source is how do you select your shots? Boy, it must have just been, I don't know. I, I If Tutsi is of a higher artistic mindset that I, I reckon uh, Tutsi is, then they probably did not approach this in a real cerebral, oh, let's set the camera here and then let's do this here. It was just, I'm just going to feel this and, and do it and capture footage and mm -hmm. who knows what the process was. But it's... it's uh, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. And yeah, the, the music goes really well with it. The visuals remind me, Tracy, I was curious if this made you think of this too, uh, of the demo scene, which for those who aren't familiar with it, the demo scene, whenever we talk about the first machinima and we talk about Diary of a Camper and those types of things, there's always this sense of, well, not exactly the first. Because back in the 1980s, as early yeah. as the 1980s, programmers were creating basically stuff like this, basically a, a scripted, triggered particle show, for lack of a better term. Now, the, the image fidelity of this compared to what they could do with graphics cards back then, obviously, there's no comparison. This looks like something that you would expect to have been rendered out of Blender. I mean, it's it's gorgeous and highly detailed. Um, very crisp and well-formed images and stuff. So it doesn't compare in terms of fidelity, as you'd expect. But as far as the theme of it and a lot of uh, strange geometry and and with what they can do nowadays, uh, mixed with a fluidity, and then there's these holographic images of, uh, of, of, of people and sh different shapes. I mean, just, it's a feast. It really is a feast. The eyes and and the ears. I mean, just it's so well suited. Um, whoever was music supervisor for the project itself for the installation, yeah, great stuff there. Like just that that's a whole art in itself of of finding music that fits with visuals or vice versa, crafting visuals to fit right. With music. 
That's a real talent. It's a totally unique thing that has nothing to do with narrative or the things that we normally focus on for filmmaking. Um, it's more of a painterly type of thing. And it's it's just when it's excited by it, um, I'm a Baudelaire fan. Um, that really didn't enter into this, though. Like, if you're worried about, well, I've never read any, you know, Fleur de Mal, don't worry about it. You don't you don't need that. It's not like Ricky said, it's not about the words um, or even about the poetry here. Um, it's about trying to kind of capture this experience. I would say if if the installation does prove to still be live, um, that's worth pursuing. If if you've got yeah. an avenue into Second Life, it's worth it because clearly that's how this was meant to be uh, perceived. Yeah. Um, I think VR would be the ultimate. I'm not even sure. Does, does Second Life even support that? I don't even know. It did for a while. I don't know if it does now. Yeah. The headsets Somebody, have gone a bit. We've, we've got listeners here who are Second Life Machinima, uh, members of the Second Life Machinima community. So if you would, let us know in the comments um, what what you know about the VR aspect of are people able to experience Second Life that way? Uh, if so, you know, send us links. We'll we'll help spread the word on that because yep, uh, Second Life's already a very interesting platform and a lot of really artistic stuff like this going on. But something like this to experience it in VR would be would be pretty amazing. So great pick, Ricky. Uh, yep. Just 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 wonderful. Uh, I, yep. I watched it multiple times. You're right. The length is perfect. Um, it's it's delicious. So thank you. Yep. In my experience watching this was very similar to the Phil's. Um, so I'm not going to repeat what you just said because... Uh, I... <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. We, we'd like to hear exactly word for word. <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> there's a couple of things I'm, I am going to add to it, though. Okay. Um, all right. So... I was actually on a bus and I was kind of coming home and I was reflecting on machinima and what we see now compared to what we used to see, um, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, back when we were doing the machinima expo and, and back when, uh, machinima.com existed in the way that we preferred it to exist, but I'm not going to go there now. Um, and I was thinking, these are the kind of videos that at least as far as my, when I'm looking for machinima, these don't come up very often, these kind of videos. So I was wondering, do people still make them? And obviously they do, because we've got the new one here from Tootsie. Um, and, I, you know, that's just one of those things. And I was thinking, well, that's kind of a shame because it's, I feel like now I'm a bit older, I can appreciate them more than I did, you know, back then. Because uh, back then they're very nice to look at, but they didn't really grab me. But now I can appreciate the artistic value of them a lot more because I understand it a lot better. Uh, and then I, I get home. And later on that evening, I looked to see what's on our list of films to watch because it was about time to see what you guys had picked. And Ricky had obviously read my mind. And uh, I watched it straight away. Uh, perfect. You were in the perfect mindset. I really was. So, you know, you timed that really nicely, uh, Ricky, picking this film. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like Phil said, this is one of those films that I don't think I would know how to make it myself. Like from the technical point, I would know how to capture the footage and all of that, but I wouldn't know how to choose what I want to, you know, capture. What what's going to work for me? Because my filmmaking mind works in such a different way. And sure. It's interesting to uh, so I look at well, this. I don't think Tootsie could necessarily make what I make, and there's nothing wrong with that either. That's um, probably true. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. kind of interesting what different styles could, you know, maybe there's a few things we can learn from each other, but not necessarily do the kind of films that we make. And uh, yeah. I like that Machinima gives yes. us filmmakers with different approaches, yes. vastly different approaches, ways to, to make the films you well, want to make. Well put. And, you know, this, this, this is a prime example of that. And I am glad that, you know, filmmakers like Tootsie are still putting out content like this. Yep. Yeah. If you're a creator, you should, I believe, you should expose yourself to a variety of things that are outside your comfort zone. If you are a person who likes to make realistic types of films that are like the things you see, that's great. 
but you should see other things to give you ideas and to break up your imagination so that when you make those realistic things or those humorous things or whatever it is you do, you have a wider space to be able to draw in your imagination from. At least that's what I believe. Yeah. And that's why films like these and why avant-garde has always been so important. Obviously, in America, the big thing is realism. Realism is always, and well-made realism with predictable plots and formula plots, that's what sells tickets. So that's what people see, and that's what they try to recreate. But if you step outside of that, you'll discover a world of artists, not only filmmakers, but writers, musicians, painters, dancers, all kinds of things that are just way outside your comfort zone. Expose yourself to those things. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is I apologize to Klaus Dieter Schultz because <laughs> his film Nine was the film that I was trying to come up with earlier. Yeah. So I'm really sorry I, I didn't course. remember it. I can only tell you I'm going to be experiencing my 69th birthday this month, so Ooh. that's my excuse. But it was Nine by Klaus Dieter Schultz. And then the last thing I want to say is that it, while we were talking, it flashed into my mind a memory of something that occurred in the 60s were called happenings. Do you guys remember these? They were primarily in the theater community where performing street performers would suddenly start a production at some odd and interesting place. And it would be a happening. Oh yeah. And every and mostly young people knew what they were and they'd gather around, they'd do an impromptu performance. Sometimes they'd be partially scripted, sometimes they wouldn't. Well also the happenings bled over into rock performances where a band would get together and they would use these visualizations behind them of fluids. They were huge round projections that had all sorts of unusual fluid things that were projected off right on the band as they were playing pink pink floyd did quite a bit of yes. this in their early yes. youth that's what this installation reminded me of are those happenings it was like a happening inside of second life except rather than being impromptu it was all set up and scheduled and they had set it up beforehand but there's a precedent for that starting in the 60s and bringing all the way to the present day. There was something very refreshing about suddenly spontaneously a dramatic presentation would occur or going to see an event that was only announced the night before or that day and having these incredible visuals. Now, of course, drugs were part of the thing that helped you appreciate the performance. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit better in the 60s. Pink Floyd, you drugs, quite have the what? Same. Yes, you don't quite have the same thing in Second Life, uh, but still it's quite entrancing, as we put it earlier. So those are my thoughts on that, and I'm so glad you guys liked that. I knew you would. Uh, and thanks yeah, for Yeah, one comments. more thing that I want to mention about this film that that uh, came to mind while, we were, while you guys were talking is, so in all of the types of machinima filmmaking, there's there's always a sense of what we would term as happy accidents, right? Or especially when you're dealing with a video game, you don't have full control over all the elements and something unusual will happen and, and it, you work yes. it into production. Well, this is, this is a whole other level of that. When you're dealing with essentially, uh, you know, the scripted particles, uh, there's this element of these are mathematical equations overlapping algorithms and equations that are playing out. And when you're coding that, you don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. You may yeah. have some general idea the more experienced you get, but there's there's a randomness to some of this movement. It's it's not like, you know, creating this in, in a platform like iClone, for example, where you just you're you're keyframing every little movement or whatever. This is it's it's something that that is beyond that there's there's again that random mathematical element weaved into the artistry uh it's fascinating and there's no other form i think where that element is so prominent than in uh the this type of type of thing um yeah a lot of experimentation 
yep. and a lot of a lot of randomness and a lot of oh wow that works i'll keep that the way it is out to have this character walk from here to there and then punch this guy you know so uh yeah that's that's it really we've mentioned this phrase a couple times during this episode but it really is it, there's a very different skill set going on here and uh and it's one worth at the very least learning to appreciate as ricky mentioned yeah um yes and and maybe even for the adventurous it's worth dabbling in and and seeing you know what you can do with it yourself um so uh not you know the creation of something like this as well as the filming of it and yeah, it's it's such a different bird, and uh, I just I, I yeah. so I'm glad that you found this. Very, recipe. yep, very different from the film we looked at last week, Emesis, where everything was carefully controlled inside yeah. of the game engine. It leads to a result that you experience as a different kind of entertainment than yes. this one. And as long as you don't restrict yourself, you, as I said, you step outside your comfort zone, you can really appreciate the quality of this interesting short film. One thing I will say about this short film, Ricky, is, is uh, this one, this one has, it doesn't even stack up to the narrative structure of the Lion King. Like it really falls, <laughs> falls flat. I'm very sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, hey, thanks for probably, joining us, everyone. What's your, they probably what's your made thoughts point, on this film? Point 0.1% profit of the original <laughs> Lion King 2. Yeah. Maybe less. <laughs> well, thanks for joining us. We would love to hear what you, the audience, think about this. Uh, drop us some feedback, either in the comments, if you're watching us on YouTube, or in the comments of wherever you've seen this episode posted, or via email at talk at completelymachinima.com. Let us know. Does Flowers of Evil and The Lion King, who would win? Yep. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you, and we'll see you next episode. Thanks to all my fans. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye.